On April 27, 1961, a new nation was born. Its name, Sierra Leone. A former British colony and protectorate with its more than two and a half million people, it is a land of contrasts, of isolated huts and air-conditioned hotels, of vast savannas and cloud-draped mountains, of tiny riverside settlements and cities like Freetown, which boasts the third largest natural harbor in the world. Hurrying to Freetown, the nation's capital, to celebrate Independence Day, were representatives of 65 nations, and of course, Sierra Leoneans themselves. They were coming to celebrate the day that a promise was kept. A promise by the British to prepare them for independence. A promise by the nation's leader, Sir Milton Augustus Margai, to lead them to independence. Margai! Margai! Sir Milton Margai, 65-year-old physician and graduate of the British University of Durham, was to be the first prime minister of the newly independent country. His foreign minister, the American-educated Dr. John Taffer, was smart, an MD and an ordained minister. Among the first foreign representatives to arrive in Sierra Leone was Prime Minister Balewa of Nigeria and members of his government. Dr. Smart, who had once taught in Nigeria, spotted an old friend of his among the delegates. Sir Maurice Dorman, British colonial governor of Sierra Leone, his wife, and Sir Milton Margai, later greeted the personal representative of the British crown, the 25-year-old Duke of Kent, cousin of the Queen. The Duke's double assignment was to convey the Queen's personal best wishes to Prime Minister Margai and to transfer the instruments of sovereignty to Sierra Leone. The changing of the colors took place on the night of April 26th. At exactly 11.58 and a half, the light on the British flag was turned off, and the green, white, and blue flag of an independent Sierra Leone unfurled for the first time. Later, the dancers started. 1,200 dancers from all 11 major Sierra Leone tribes performed for an audience of 70,000. The next morning, the Sierra Leone Parliament was called into session, and Sir Maurice Dorman took the oath of office as Governor General of the country. As Governor General, he was no longer responsible to the British government, but rather to the representatives of the people of Sierra Leone. Next, the Duke of Kent handed the instruments of sovereignty to Sir Milton Margai. Sierra Leone, the 12th member of the British Commonwealth of Nations, was now officially independent. where Christian, pagan, and Muslim live side by side. This church was built by Americans. The congregation belongs to the Timney tribe.
British and American Christian missionaries have worked in the colony and the protectorate since the beginning, just as Muslim missionaries have. Christianity came from the sea. Islam, overland, from North Africa. Today, the majority of the people are Muslim. Do tensions exist among them? Apparently not. In fact, the encouragement to build Christian mission schools has often come from the Muslims themselves. At a Muslim ceremony on Independence Day, this theme from the Quran was chosen as if to underline the need for cooperation. If ye are grateful, I will increase thee in power, knowledge, and blessing. But if ye are ungrateful, surely my wrath and punishment are severe and tormenting. Although my country is a new country, having its birthday only on the 27th of April, yet this does not mean that we have not been for a long time interested in world affairs. We have not yet had an opportunity to formally pronounce on our foreign policy, but already the Prime Minister has given an indication of the two lines along which it will be built. The first line is naturally uh, a line which is pertaining to our economic foreign policy. We hope to have an open door policy along economic uh, affairs because our country is one of those that are at the present time underdeveloped. We recognize that it is only the free flow of capital and technical ability that will help us. So we want our door to be open to anyone who wants to come and help us with capital, with ability, with uh, technical knowledge. Or in terms of non-alignment, as some of our African colleagues have said, we are going to take one step forward and say, here is a new country that, like a child, though not in naivety like a child, but because it is our wish, we are going to be friendly to all countries until such a time as they reject our friendship. I am Honorable Paramount Chief Madame Ella Koblo Gulama of Sierra Leone, the first and only woman member of parliament. Now that our country has achieved, achieved uh, uh, independence, I think that the women of my country would be very much interested in more medical facilities, more schools, so that our children will become educated. In years gone by, we have suffered from more inf infant mortality, and the rate at which the death toll was going up was very high. And that for the past few years, uh, people have become very, very much interested in education. And there is the urge for people to send their children to school. A few years ago, while I was in the States, on a State Department visit. Wherever I went in America, I was asked a question about communism in my country. And at that time, I was hearing about communism for the first time. Now that our country has gained independence, I'm sure that outside people who are interested in communism will make it their business to interfere into our internal workings of our country. I, for one, and I'm speaking for the, for the women folk of my country, will stand against any move to introduce communism in our country. We have far too many things to bother or to think about than communism. We hate interference, and we have been practicing democracy and hope to continue to practice democracy even after our independence. Next year, 1962, we hope to have a general election. And it will be the first time all women in Sierra Leone will be taking part in the voting for their representative. And I'm sure that the women are looking forward to that time when they could be well represented in the legislature of our country. After general elections, or during the elections, we hope to campaign for as many women as possible so that we can capture as many seats 
in the legislature. For the simple reason, there are many, many things we'd like to fight for. For health facilities, for education, as I have just mentioned, and for other things, the freedom of women, especially in Sierra Leone. We think we want to have ample opportunities given to us and would like to take our place side by side with our men folk in Sierra Leone. Uh, the leaders, many of the leaders in Nigeria and in Ghana have had their education in Freetown. So that uh, Freetown's contribution has been a West African one and not a purely Sierra Leonean. But uh, secondly, a country doesn't live by education alone. It's got to have a strong, viable economy. And it has only been uh, within recent months, recent years, that the economy of Sierra Leone has built up to the point where they can confidently go ahead into the future. At the, oh, during the last election, I made the election broadcast for my party, SLPP. And my promise to the electorate was that if they followed my government, I would lead them to independence within the lifetime of this house. The life of the house will, will, will expire next year, about July, but I might spring a surprise and arrange for election earlier. All I would want to do is return to electorate. I've done the duty which I promised you. This is what I said. Now, well, let us go now to the electorate and you'll decide what form of government you want. Today, we spoke to Dr. Ernest Eastman, a descendant of the emancipated slaves who had settled in Sierra Leone in 1787. We asked him about the early history of his country. The colony of Sierra Leone was founded by several waves of people of African origin. The fourth set were slaves in the cities of England who had been freed by the judgment of Lord Chief Justice Mansfield in 1772. On being set free, their masters abandoned them and they roamed about as in itinerant vagrants, causing trouble to the poor law authorities of England. Granville Sharp and his friends, who afterwards were responsible for the abolition of the slave trade, 1807, the abolish, abolition of slavery, 1833, formed a society for the relief of poor blacks and collected all these former slaves now destitute in London. Some had been servants from the West Indies, not farm servants, but the house servants there, and some were ex-soldiers from British regiments. They collected them to the number of about 411 and with the help of the British Navy, transported them to the Sierra Leone River. There was no Freetown in those days, and the land was bought from the Timini King and given over to the English government for the use of these poor blacks who had just come from Britain. About Eight years later, there was a war in uh, Jamaica called the Maroon War. And at the end of that war, the Maroons were captured and transported to Nova Scotia. And again, these Maroons from the West Indies were brought to Sierra Leone. And Sierra Leone then had two communities. The settlers, mostly from America, southern states, and the Maroons from the West Indies. In 1807, slave trade was abolished, and the British fleet had the task of intercepting ships taking slaves from Africa to the West Indies and America. 
these slaves and ships were landed in Freetown and legally and formally set free and the ships destroyed. The main link between the former protectorate of Sierra Leone and the former colony is a meandering railroad 311 miles long. During World War II, the bazaars of India and the jungles of Burma heard Sierra Leone soldiers sing about it in Calypso style. The train to bow, she no grieve for to go. The engine she done tire for lack of plenty fire. The train to bow, she no grieve for to go. But go she does, bringing the bananas and the rice and the palm oil and the spices, the produce of the hinterland, into Freetown, making the former colony and protectorate one. And of course, trading is a two-way street, and it is to the coast that those from back country often come to buy pottery and tobacco. And whatever small items of luxury an agricultural people with an average annual income of $47 can afford. Places that hark back to ancient bazaars are side by side with modern shopping centers. Sierra Leone has its traffic policemen, its libraries, its movie theaters, its department stores stocked with goods from all over the world, its five o'clock rush hours. And its new banks and, of course, its industries. Sierra Leone, for example, is the third largest diamond producing country in the world. Its iron ore deposits yield more than one and a half million tons of ore concentrates a year. Its exports, though, do not match the cost of its imports. Going out of the country, we have diamonds, iron ore, palm kernels and oil, coffee, cocoa and cola nuts. Coming in, manufactured goods, machinery, fuel oils, cement. This imbalance will of course have to be corrected. Sierra Leone, as one observer said, is moving into the cold, harsh world of loans, advisors, economists, budgets and deficits which go along with freedom and independence, and which is so different from the cozy world of mere legislative councils under a paternal imperialism. the challenge of freedom than any outsiders, simply because the challenge is put to them, Sierra Leoneans have started to expand their 3,000 miles of roads, using equipment as up-to-date as found anywhere. They are putting up government buildings. What would freedom be without a new parliament building? They're pushing ahead on housing, and are adding to their 76 hospitals and clinics. Working in the favor of Sierra Leone's success is the country's absolute determination to push ahead with education. Here we see its 35th secondary school of building. Three years ago, there were only 26. At the primary school level, it has about 550 schools and some 75,000 students. At the university level, it has Fura Bay College, founded in 1827, the first institution of its kind in all sub-Saharan Africa. Affiliated with the University of Durham in Britain, it offers degree courses in theology, science, liberal arts, and economics. In addition, it has a training program for future teachers. The college stands on the spot where once was located a stockade for slaves. As if saying that the advent of independence was not just a time for dedication, but also of joy, one of the highlights of the week-long independence celebration was a beauty contest. April 27, 1961. 
During the week of independent celebrations, Sierra Leone played a series of soccer matches. They may have won independence, but not this particular match against Nigeria. Nine days before independence, Sierra Leone arrested 31 members of a party called the All People's Congress. The official explanation, quote, the APC does not apparently welcome independence. They want to create disturbances, demonstrations, and confusion during independence, and to bring the whole country into contempt and ridicule. These people are financed from abroad, unquote. One argument of the APC was that the country should have new elections before independence. Sir Milton insisted the election should come later. He was able to make his decision stick because of two things, his great popular support, here we see the unveiling of a bust of the prime minister, and second, the fact that his coalition government elected in 1957 is supported by the tribal chiefs of the country. In fact, Sir Milton's solution to the common African problem of tribal tensions is unique. He has made the most important chiefs of the country members of his government. In an interview, Sir Milton discussed independence, the role of tribal chiefs, and the matter of elections. I am very glad for this moment because I had worked for years behind the chiefs, and they followed me very carefully. I feel it is about this time not a correct thing to leave them in a separate house just to be in an advisory body. And it is not, in order not, that, not to disappoint them, I feel they ought to work with the government. Hence, I'm running only one house. Governor General Dorman and his thoughts. In the past, Sierra Leone has been a country that has had um, a strong educational background. As far ago as 1826, the uh, University College of Fura Bay was giving higher education to West Africans. So now some people may wonder why it is that Sierra Leone is rather uh, later in its approach to independence than Ghana or Nigeria. The answer is twofold. First, our own people have gone down the coast to help Nigeria, Ghana, and the Congo during the last century. The uh, first missionary society uh, expedition that went to Nigeria was mounted from Freetown. It included the first African bishop and about 20 African priests from Freetown. Sierra Leone. One more African nation emerging into the bright light of freedom. Proud of its past, hopeful, yes, and determined about its future. A country that remembers the bravery of the emancipated slaves who in 1787 built their homes along the shores of the mountains of the lion, Sierra Leone. May we all remember what President Kennedy's representative said to Sir Milton Margai. History has bequeathed on both our nations a common awareness of the rightness of our goals of freedom and brotherhood for all men. With goodwill and God's help, let us forge new bonds of friendship in a common advance towards this high.